This summer, we have been going through these psalms, listening to them, hearing them, and we just heard Psalm 22. And I think it's one thing to just hear these psalms read with the spoken word. Uh, We know that originally they were sung. We know their original languages, but we don't know the original music that went with them because the psalms, of course, are the original hymn book of those in faith that have come before us. And there is something very different between hearing something spoken and hearing something sung, as we just did. Hearing the Psalms, seeing their words, we can understand them in certain ways, understand them mentally. But when they're sung, I think that adds a layer of understanding, a layer maybe of emotion or a heart layer that isn't there when we just hear these words said aloud. And so there's a difference between understanding something and understanding it deeply. And of course, when the Holy Spirit is present with us and we hear a psalm like that sung, uh, we can understand that even, even more deeply, this difference between hearing something said and letting it sink into our hearts, into our feelings, maybe even letting it shape our identity or or identifying with it in a way that we wouldn't normally identify with it because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, because of the way it's communicated in, in music, that, that difference between those things. Today, as we hear Psalm 22, I believe that, that God is calling us to understand deeply three truths, not just to hear them, Not just to listen to the words, but to let them sink into our hearts and minds. Because if we do that, if we understand these three truths deeply, then I believe they are actually life-changing. They're not just things to agree to or uh, mental things to assent to. Uh, They are deep truths that we can understand. But before we get into those three truths, I want to step back with you for a minute and just kind of look at the big picture of this psalm, because it is a long psalm. So I want to invite you to turn in your bulletins to that center panel, and there you'll see the whole psalm printed out. We did, as Betsy read and sang it to us, which was so beautiful, uh, we did skip a little part of it, but it's all there, and I'm sure you can tell because of how small the font is. But if you uh, bring it close to your eyes or far away, depending on your needs, Um, we will look closely at that psalm from time to time. Now, in a moment, I'll refer to some specific verses, so you want to keep that handy during the sermon. Uh, But but before we do that, I want to point out just kind of the big picture um, uh, form of this psalm. Because the psalm begins from verse 1 to the end of verse 21 as one thing, and then it shifts rapidly from verse 22 and on to another thing. The first part of the psalm is the psalmist, who's David, by the way. This is written by King David. And this is him writing about these incredible hardships that he has suffered. That he feels so alone and is so scared of death that he feels like God has abandoned him. For David, in that first part of the psalm, he has the appearance of God's absence And he feels that so incredibly deeply. And then at verse 22, all of a sudden it's a big shift. And suddenly David starts praising God and uh, singing the glories of God and uplifting God. And so we have this major tension in the psalm. On On one side, the appearance of the absence of God. And on the other side, the glory of God and the goodness of God and the promises of God and the, the acknowledgement that God is never absent. And so how do we understand this tension? David, as he writes this, is certainly living in this tension. He deeply understands, not just mentally understands, but deeply understands in his heart the reality of these two things. These two almost extremes, we could say. He lives in that tension. And there are times we live in that tension too. There are times when we absolutely feel like God has abandoned us. And yet at the same time, we know in faith that God is good, that God is kind, that God is faithful, that he keeps his promises, and that he is there with us all the time. That's that tension 
that we live in. The Psalms, you know, were Jesus' prayer book too. Jesus would have prayed these prayers with his family. He would have prayed them every day with his mother, Mary, with his foster father, Joseph. He would have gathered at least weekly with his community and prayed these prayers together. He knew these prayers. And that is just one little way. We'll talk about another way later, but that's one little way that we know that Jesus himself understood this tension too. This tension between the feeling of the appearance of the absence of God and the goodness of God. So we live in this tension, but this psalm brings us three truths that enable us, equip us to live in this tension in such a way that that we can live fully for God and we can even see beyond this tension. And I'll I'll tell you how to do that in a moment. But first, the the first truth that we want to hear from this psalm and that we want to deeply understand from this psalm is our experience of the presence of God. We want to understand and think about our lives the way David is in the first part of the psalm, that sometimes even though we know that God is present, we know that he's promised to be present, we want to understand that that is not always our experience. That our experience is often uh, this sense that God is not present in our lives that there are times of suffering, that there are times of fear, there are times of doubt, there's concern of death even, like David is describing in the psalm. There are these dark times when we might think that God is not present. As we think back on our lives, you probably can think of a time or a season like that, or maybe you're in that kind of season right now. When I was a a, a kid, a, a teenager actually, my grandfather died, and I remember it was uh, very early in the morning, like 2 or 3 a.m. That's my memory anyway. And, and uh, I remember my dad got a call, and we all went over to my grandma's house to gather and to grieve. And we had a new pastor at the church, and he came to be with us at that early hour. It was amazing. He came and, and sat with us, and I don't remember him saying a word. I don't even remember him praying, though I'm sure he spoke and I'm sure he prayed, but I just remember him being there. We all sat around in the room, I think in silence for quite some time, and I even remember looking at Pastor Susie and seeing him close his eyes a little bit as he fell asleep, just (laughs) sitting there, you know. But his presence there was so meaningful. In seminary, in a class, and every pastor will tell you this, that when we talk about Christian caring, one of the things that's popular for Christians to talk about, about being there for one another and caring for one another, we say things like, you know, 90% of it is just showing up, just being present. And I actually, I understand what that means, and I think what it means is right, but I, I just wouldn't say it that way. Because showing up is so important. There's so much more to it than that. Because if Pastor Susie hadn't been there, it's not just that his absence would have been felt. It's not just that we would have, would have wished he was there and he wasn't. There actually would have been an emptiness. There would have actually been something nearly tangible missing from our grieving process. We needed him there. But if he hadn't been there, it, it would have changed everything. Now, magnify that when we think about what it's like to feel that God isn't present. To be going through something and wonder where God is, to cry out to God and ask God why he isn't there. Think about a time in your life when that was you. When did you question where God was or ask God why he had allowed something or wondered if he would show up in your life or in the life of a loved one. What was that like for you? Was it, was it as devastating as it was for David? Because David starts this psalm with that, that chorus that we sang. That's the first line of this psalm. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cries out to God because he's going through this horrible thing, this dark time. Now, when we read through this, and David is describing all of these things that are happening to him that he's afraid of, 
we actually don't know what experience he's describing. Because we know a lot about David's life, and there's nothing in David's life that parallels what he's describing. So he is talking about some dark time in his life that we don't know. There were certainly dark times that we know. He was ill, but this is not an illness. He ran away from Saul, fretted for his life. In that situation, he was nearly stoned in, or, or threatened with stoning anyway in 1 Samuel, but none of those quite fit what David is experiencing. But nonetheless, we certainly know that whatever it is that he's going through, he understands it deeply. He knows it. Let's look at a few verses. If you look at your bulletin, in verse 1, uh, he's got this cry that we just affirm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? In verse 2, he says, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. In verse 3, he talks about how God has helped his ancestors, and we might read that in another context, another context, like, great, God helped his ancestors, but that's not what he means here. What he means is, you even helped my ancestors. Why aren't you helping me? In verse 6, he says, I am a worm. It's this illustration of, 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 of humiliation, of being trampled on underfoot with contempt. And in verse 7, it adds this whole new layer of not just suffering, but also persecution. Because enemies come into the scene and they, and they mock him. Hostiles have now entered the picture. So it's not just suffering, but he's also being insulted. And then in verse 14, we have this description of his whole being. And he says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. And then throughout the entire first section, we hear that he's surrounded by dogs. He's surrounded by evildoers, by bulls, by lions, by oxen. This is the absence of God that he feels that he's describing. He is being incredibly honest. He's being painfully realistic. I mean, this is a pain that is beyond just, just emptiness. Like when you have a dinner party and you've invited some guests and then someone doesn't show up. You miss them and it might even be awkward because everyone was expecting that person. And you look at that empty chair and you know that that person didn't show up. Well, that, that is nothing compared to the absence of God in David's life. David knows his experience. He understands deeply what it means to experience this, this absence that he feels. Do you know yours? Do you understand it deeply like David did? If you were going to write this psalm yourself, if you were the author of this psalm, what would you write? What laments would you put down? And what questions would you ask God? And so deeply understanding this experience helps us, as you'll see in a moment, live in this tension that the psalmist, that David describes between the absence of God and the goodness of God. Because that's the second thing we want to deeply understand, not just our experience of the absence of God, but also we want to deeply understand the goodness of God. And David certainly does here. This psalm, it's like whiplash, right? You've got all this lament, and then suddenly God is good. There's so many great things about God, and he, he lists them, and he goes on and on about them. I love that. I've, I've mentioned this before, I think, but, you know, in those old Hanna-Barbera cartoons, like Scooby-Doo especially, Scooby-Doo's there, and they look, at, he looks at something, maybe it's the, the monster or something, and, and, and then he looks back, and he does a double take, like, did I see what I just think I saw? And there's that sound effect that I can't make, but it's like a doo 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 and he looks at it, and there it is, right? It's like, what is going on here? That's what this psalm is, this back and forth, like, What? And suddenly David swings to this reality of the goodness of God. Look at verse 22. He says, in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Right away, after this experience of the absence of God, he turns to the community, to the church. And we discover he is actually not as alone as we thought he was. And verse 24 he says, God did not hide his face from me, but he heard me when I cried to him. 
In verse 27, he says, all nations shall worship God. Verse 28, everything that belongs to him. Verse 29, I shall live for him, he writes. And he's writing this, remember, just after he's been talking constantly about death, about the fear of dying, and then he, he switches and said, and I am going to live for him. And verse 30 says that he's going to even proclaim God's deliverance to future generations. He's asking for this rescue from death, and he knows that God is going to do it. And verse 31, he, he says that, he, he, saying, he even says that God has done it, that he has done that deliverance. It's like looking back one day, David just knows that at some point he's going to look back and he's going to know that God delivered him. That kind of goodness, that kind of faith. We want to know our experience, but do we know the goodness of God the way David does? Now, this is important. This is the key right here, because we got these two, these two things in this psalm that, that have this, this tension. But this is not the point of the psalm. It's kind of good news, I guess. I mean, thank, thanks to this psalm that we get to hear, yeah, even though there are times when we think God is absent, God is good. Okay, that's good news. Thank you, Psalm, for telling me that God is good in the midst of bad times. That is good news. We think maybe that God is not present, but the other side of this is that God is always good, and, and that is great news. But the reality of this psalm is not just, hey, you know, there are times we think God isn't, isn't there, but he's really there when you think he's not. That's good news, but it's, it, there's more than that. In fact, this third thing that we want to deeply understand from this psalm is actually the best thing that you're going to hear all week. It's the best thing I've actually ever heard in my life. Because the thing to deeply understand, the third and final thing to deeply understand from this psalm is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. It's actually in this psalm. And it is, in fact, the one thing that doesn't just settle the tension between these two things. It is the one and only thing that actually completely sets us free from that tension. Because as David is describing all through the psalm, whether he's talking about God's goodness or, or the lament that he's, he's talking about, he is describing two things. First, he's describing this experience that we don't know that he, what it is exactly, but he's talking about his own experience. But secondly, he is prophetically talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's why this psalm is something that has been called for a long time, centuries and centuries, the fifth gospel. Because the whole gospel is in this psalm. We immediately see these connections from the psalm and what happens in it to the crucifixion that you heard as Heather read. Let's look at a few of those connections. Uh, first of all, verse 7. David's talking about being mocked, and we read those, and that is exactly what happens to Jesus. In Matthew, people walk by Jesus, and, and Matthew tells us that all who passed by Jesus derided him mocked him. In verse 8, those, those mocking David say, let God rescue him. That's exactly what they say to Jesus Christ. They say, ah, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him. The priests say that to Jesus. The scribes say that to Jesus. The elders say, even, even the thieves on the cross next to Jesus say, do their mocking of him in that context. Verses 14 to 16 actually describe what crucifixion is like. Even though crucifixion as a form of, of punishment was not even known until Roman times. Verse 18, they cast lots for clothes in verse 18. And we know that that happened too at the crucifixion. They, when they had crucified him, one of the gospels tell us, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. And then, of course, that first verse, Jesus, as he dies, cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He uses this psalm. And it's true that just saying the first line of a psalm was like its title. And, and Jesus in many ways was referencing the entire psalm, his psalm, his prayer that he grew up with in his prayer book. He calls that out on the cross because this is what's happening to him. And David is being prophetic here. And Jesus calls out on the cross this very thing. And as he does that, he understands that tension. He is in that tension. He knows the the experience, the appearance of the absence of God right then and there on the cross. And he also knows the goodness of God right there on the cross, that God is good and that God can help. That's the message of the gospel. And when we understand it deeply, then we discover that it is through the very things that make us think that God is not present. It's through those very sufferings and those very, the fear of death and even death itself. It's through those things that make us think God isn't there that God becomes the most present. God actually turns suffering into something else. He actually reverses death, you see. That's the very way he saved us. He's using those things in the psalm that David is lamenting to be present for the whole world and even for us. Let me tell you what I mean, because in the psalm, right, David David prayed for rescue from death. That's what he's asking for. But Christ... His rescue was accomplished by death. For when Christ died, God was the most present with the world because after that came resurrection. God enters into suffering. He changes it. He doesn't just show up. It's not just some kind of sentimental presence, some feel-good presence. He actually comes and he changes these dark things, these hard things, these suffering things. Now, our awareness of the presence of God might not be there at any given time. We might be really struggling uh, even from time to time or some of us for our entire lives. But even when our awareness of his presence isn't there, we discover that he, he... that his being present on the cross has an outcome, that there is a result of that presence. Something real has happened. Something real has changed because the good news changes those, those things, those sufferings, transforms them. I, uh, this was many years ago. Um, I was with a family who uh, the mother, grandmother, Uh, was near death, and she had been supported on machines for a few days, uh, and the time had come to turn those machines off. That was a decision that the family had made. There were, the brain activity wasn't there. She was the matriarch of the family, and it was time to say goodbye. And so the whole family gathered around the hospital bed, and they asked me to come and to, to, to be there with them. We said a prayer, And the doctor and the nurses there uh, did everything so kindly and nicely. But when the machines were turned off, took a few minutes, and then the nurse made the pronouncement, there at that moment, and this was a family of great faith, at that moment there was kind of a, a silent awkwardness in the family where no one knew what to say or what to speak. And at that point, I read a passage of Scripture. And it was a gospel passage, a passage that affirmed that death has been changed because of what Jesus Christ did. And after we all heard that passage, that that good news, suddenly it was completely different. The sense in that room changed radically from this awkward silence to really this sense of peace and joy as they gave thanks to God for their mother, their grandmother, their great-grandmother's life. It was an absolutely tangible difference. That tension, they, they stepped above that tension. That's the tension we live in. But if we understand deeply 
that experience and we understand deeply the goodness of God and most of all, if we understand deeply the, the, the message of the gospel, we rise above that tension. We understand that it is through the worst things that God can give us the best, that God can transform pain and suffering into joy, that he actually changes death into life and that he lets us know that he is really present, even when we think he's not. Amen. Let's stand.